we know that the government has today been setting out its new targets for protecting wildlife and biodiversity uh, with six months to go until it hosts the COP26 climate change conference. We've got plans to restore peatland with a ban on the sale of peat for the garden, proposals for three new community forests as part of proposals to treble the rate of tree planting. And uh, as we've just been discussing, um, there will be these new legal targets to say to uh, the government has got to ensure um, that, it's protect, that it protects various species. How are you going to do it? Well, I, I, the first thing to say, this it shows that we're serious about this, because I think in the past there's always been a theory, yeah, it sounds like a good, uh, sounds like a good idea, it sounds warm, but will they actually ever do it? And I think the, the way this is now unfolding in front of our eyes indicates the seriousness with which this is being taken. Uh, of course, it's a big unanswered question of what, what would those legal sanctions actually involve? Would anybody take any notice of them? Uh, I, I'm b b confident that they will, partly because there's a, they, we're, not, we're, not try, we're not forcing anybody here to do something that they don't know instinctively is right and that they don't know instinctively they actually want to do. So, yeah. Farmers have a big role to play in all of this, don't they, about um, protecting the wildlife uh, on the landscapes that they farm, um, about ensuring that there is diversity, about leaving hedgerows and all of that. Um, but what a lot of those farmers are very concerned about are the prospects of things like a free trade deal. We've had Liz Truss, your uh, colleague in Cabinet, very keen indeed to sign a free trade deal with Australia. How can you possibly have a free trade deal with Australia that's not going to allow cheap imports of Australian goods that's going to undercut what our British farmers are doing? Well, nothing's been agreed yet, so that we're only sort of speculating about what we've read in the uh, read in the papers. So, uh, and so let, let's see how let's see how that pans out. But the intention and the commitment has always been to make sure that UK farmers, uh, in whatever sector they happen to be, are uh, protected by these deals, or at least uh, are, are are able to conduct themselves on a competitive basis. Nothing that I've heard indicates that that's going to be different. And your point about uh, the way in which the, the land is uh, looked after the custodianship of farming. I don't think there's any better example in the world than the uh, uh, than farmers in the in the UK for doing that and doing it actually, you know, free as well. They don't, you know, they've always done it as a sense of duty and a sense of pride. They don't have to be. They've never necessarily needed to be financially incentivised to do that work. Uh, but I mean, Australia has got a great production of beef and lamb, um, which it does um, pretty cheaply. Obviously, it's going to want to sell those sorts of products um, here in the UK. And perhaps British consumers would say, uh, well, if that means going to mean I can get, um, you know, cheaper um, beef for my steak on a Saturday night, um, they'd be delighted to have that. Well, I, I think consumers are much more aware of the uh, welfare practices and environmental practices of rearing. Uh, uh, rearing food anyway, so for a start, so I don't think that necessarily follows. Uh, but I also think, you know, the whole, the reason it's called a, a trade deal is because it's a deal. We have to reach agreement. We have to negotiate these points. And we have been absolutely clear, George Eustace has been crystal clear about the, what the minimum expectation, minimum standards are uh, likely to be for any deal with any country uh, on any of these issues. So, uh, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the ambition of the government is, could not be clearer in this area. Area, and it's also completely consistent with the sort of the whole ethos around COP26 and beyond. So are you in there in the cabinet batting on behalf of the farmers trying to say let's not have any of these cheap imports? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a huge, an iconic Welsh lamb market and Welsh beef market. My job is to uh, to promote that. But in the wider context, obviously, wanting to do deals, we need to do these uh, free trade uh, deals. And our agriculture community in Wales is as keen for us to do them uh, as anybody. Because also it is, you know, reciprocal. It does allow us to uh, uh, open up markets we haven't had available to us before. So this is not, you know, it shouldn't be presented as all a whole long list of negatives. There are some real opportunities for UK farmers, and in my case, farmers in Wales in particular. The future of Welsh lamb is a good one, I hope. Uh, Tom Newton Dunn uh, wants to come in with a question here. Yes, are you able to look Welsh farmers in the face? As a former Countryside Alliance chair, nonetheless, as a, as a proud Welshman, a proud agricultureman, are you able to look Welsh farmers in the face and say, after any trade deal with Australia, or quite frankly the US, you will still be able to sell the same amount of beef and lamb as you sell now? Well, uh, can I just go back two strides on this? 
we have not signed a deal with Australia yet. So we're, we're talking as if this thing is done and dusted and somehow it's adversely affecting uh, agriculture in the UK. It is not done and dusted, so we're not in a position to say that. But absolutely, so I, that I, have, I, have, you know, I have family ratios. I have to look farmers in the eye pretty well every weekend because you know they're part of my family. So I have to be able to do that and be able to do so, uh, uh, as I say, with all of the evidence and arguments at my fingertips. And yeah, of course, that is, that is what I want to uh, be able to persuade them that what we're doing is actually not only safeguards what they're trying to do, but also actually creates additional opportunities too. And the agriculture community in Wales, do not forget, yeah. was was amongst the most uh, enthusiastic advocates of leaving the European Union. And they absolutely realised that that means opportunity. So to be clear, I think you just said Welsh farmers are going to be selling the same amount of beef and lamb, despite the fact Australian farmers are selling in cheaper products. It's a difficult economic prospect to no, consider. No, no. I, it's not, because I, I, I'm, I'm very careful here to try and not speculate about what future markets, may, where they may necessarily end up, and to expect anybody to sit here and say that the future is definite negatively or positively, is a, is a, dare I say it, quite an unfair question because you know, we don't know in a free market exactly which direction that market will go. Uh, but what we can do is make sure there are sufficient safeguards in it to protect their interests. So and that's, what, a that's, transition a, and that's what we're doing. Is that what you're looking at? A transition, <laughs> ten-year transition well, your words, nice your, your, your words, Your uh, words, not mine. You've been reading the same news, you've been reading the same news articles that I okay. have. How does that work? Um, but this, well, it, it has, nothing has been decided. Nothing has been decided. It is a deal. It is a deal. And as we know, because we had similar conversations in the round-up to Brexit, everybody speculating about where it might end up, mainly speculating that it wouldn't end up anywhere, and they were all wrong. So let's just wait a little bit longer before we start uh, uh, deciding that all of these things are set in concrete. We know that the Prime Minister is very keen on these free trade agreements, a sign of the global Britain post-Brexit. Um, do you feel that you've got to battle pretty hard to convince him on this one? Uh, I think the PM has never, uh, ever been difficult to negotiate with as far as protecting uh, the interests of UK producers and farmers. He is, he is, uh, on many occasions, been their greatest advocate. So, in terms of recognising what all of this means, uh, in not only in financial terms but uh, ecological terms as well, in our COP26 context where we started this conversation, um, the PM is B PM is very focused on these points. Uh, let me just ask you as a government minister about one other issue on which there does seem to have been quite a bit of confusion, and that's when it comes to foreign travel. Uh, we know that there are very few countries on the green list, uh, the amber list. It's no longer illegal to travel to these countries, but people do have to quarantine mm -hmm. when they return. We had the health secretary at the weekend saying very clearly that people should not go on holiday to amber list countries. The Environment Secretary George Eustace seemed to strike a rather different tone. We've had Mark Drakeford, who is the First Minister in Wales, where you are, saying that um, people, people from Wales shouldn't really be going on holiday. Um, what is the British government's stance on amber list countries? I think the expression I heard used today was uh, apply personal responsibility if it's essential. That's one thing. If it isn't essential, you have to ask yourself serious questions whether you should be doing that. But we're not a we're not a dictatorial government in that respect. So uh, I think that expression, as we, which we've heard today, whether it was from Matt Hancock from the PM, I can't remember, uh, was an entirely sensible one. You know, people uh, people have been fantastically pragmatic and sensible during this whole uh, process, and are perfectly capable of being able to work out what amber means and whether their trip therefore qualifies or doesn't. I don't think it probably needs uh, to you know, me to uh, leap into that uh, conversation. If it's essential, not for a holiday then, to an amber list country. Well, some people might think a holiday is essential. I can think of quite a lot of people who, who do think that. But no, it's, it's about common sense. We're good at common sense. We're good at common sense as a as a population, and 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 I think that I think it is absolutely clear what Matt and and what the PM have in mind here, and I, I so I don't think we can again create a confusion where none exists. 